Welcome back to The Breakfast. Uh, we're trying to make it as cheerful as possible. Uh, and so I, I think we can call this good news, what we're going to be sharing next. Um, a 22-year-old music studio assistant, Yahya Sharif Aminu, was sentenced to death by hanging on August 10th, 2020, after he was convicted of blasphemy by an Islamic court in northern Nigeria. The judgment document states that uh, Sharif Aminu Yahya made a blasphemous statement against Prophet Muhammad in a WhatsApp group. They said his statement is contrary to the Kano State Sharia Penal Code and is an offense which carries a death sentence. Uh, if you remember when the news of Sharif Aminu's uh, alleged crime broke, protesters burnt his family home and um, you know, it, it became you know, chaos across the country. But on Thursday, January 21st, 2020, the appeal court uh, appeal Division of the Kano State High Court set aside a death sentence passed on him. The court ordered a retrial of the case against Sheriff, who had filed an appeal to challenge the sentence. Legal practitioner Mr. Monde Obani now joins us to discuss this. Thank you so much. Good morning to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning good for morning. having me. <laughs> All right. Um, let's get your, you know, your thoughts, first of all, on the case. Uh, uh, many people are celebrating um, this um, order of a retrial. But at the same time, there's people who wonder why there was even a death sentence in the first place. If we are a secular state, as we describe ourselves. Um, so let's start with that. You know, why, what are your thoughts on, on the case so far? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think this is a case uh, that should enable uh, Nigeria to know the state of our constitution with regard to some of these laws that have been enacted all over the place that runs contrary to the express provision of the constitution. If you recall that we have a, a constitutional provision on the issue of uh, secularity of the state, I'm talking about section 10 of, of the 1999 constitution yes. that says that no particular state or the federation should adopt any religion uh, in Nigeria. So Nigeria is clearly a, a secular state. But we have this uh, Sharia law that some of the northern states have actually enacted that clearly violates that particular provision. They have more or less adopted a, a state religion contrary to the express provision of the constitution. And they have even gone ahead and enact some of these criminal offenses you know, uh, that violates the, the people's right like issue of amputation, issue of uh, uh, if, if you blaspheme, uh, you, you will be sentenced to death. And so this man's case uh, uh, is clearly a case that will uh, make us to know the state of our uh, jurisprudence on this issue of Sharia law that has been enacted uh, by the various northern states. Now, what has happened so far with the trial is that there was uh, so much irregularity in the trial process. He was not allowed any legal representation. There was threat on lives of lawyers if they did, you know, did uh, represent him. And so no lawyer was uh, allowed to represent. And the court itself that even tried, you know, is mandatorily under the law to provide a legal representation if there is no uh, norm that comes forward. But they did not even fulfill that requirement of the law. So they went ahead and, and, and sentenced him to death. And so what has happened now is that the appeal uh, section of the High Court in Kano have actually observed that those irregularities and has ordered that the matter uh, be taken back to a different judge and be retried. So even at that, after that retrial, we should be able to know what will be the sentence of that court and then pursue this matter on issue of constitutionality and then issue of Sharia law that now says that blasphemy is a criminal offence on our students. We should be able to pursue it up the Supreme Court and be able to set this matter uh, as, as settled once, uh, once and for all. And I think that is what will be expected with regards to this uh, uh, controversial case. All right. Still talking about this fundamental issue of uh, the Sharia law. There are about 12 states in Nigeria, you know, that are Muslim states and so practice Sharia law. But if we can all agree that this contravenes, as you said, Section 10, and that, you know, the Constitution specifies that we are a secular state, why does the Constitution not hold much weight when it comes to, you know, law and judiciary in these other 12 states of the country? Why does the Sharia law seem to hold more significance? Maybe, maybe as I said earlier, people are afraid to challenge some of these unconstitutional acts uh, by these northern states, especially those of them who are from those states. You know, there is this palpable fear and then sometimes uh, mob action against you and your family if you speak against certain, you know, wrongful acts that have been done. 
you know, the, the, the pervasive uh, uh, presence of religious uh, uh, beliefs and all that is there. This young man that we're talking about, you know, his house, his father's house, we are all burned down yes. by the mob. And people were really afraid. Even some lawyers that I know, you know, that are constitutional law, I mean, lawyers who are rights, law, rights activists, they were afraid to represent. Because your house or your, even your chamber, you know, could be a target. And before you know it, because of the pervasive religious sentiment that is that pervades, you know, just most of these northern states. So it is important we know this, that judiciary will have a role, a very big role to play in a, in, a, in, a, in a position to really settle most of this constitutional violation by these states. This issue of blasphemy, as I said earlier, is nowhere recorded in any of our criminal code. And if there is issue of blasphemy, and what have you blasphemed, that is not recognized even by our constitution, then the issue is that the judiciary must be in a position to set the, you know, these things are right by saying this is the position of the law. So it, the, the constitution is a provision of the law, right or right, but it is a judiciary that we have to strengthen the applicability of these laws. You know? So when pronouncements have been made by the court that this is the correct position of our jurisprudence with regards to some of these things that have been flying all over the place, then I think that people will, will, will begin to sit up. But as long as the judiciary is being intimidated and all that, that's why you see some of these breaches of, uh, of our constitutional provision going on. So I think that the judiciary ultimately has the ultimate responsibility of setting things are right concerning some of these things we have just mentioned. Yeah, but it, it, it almost seems like we're going to find ourselves back in this space again sometime in the future. It's, it's, it may not take long before another person is sentenced to death again uh, for something, you know, um, like this. But before we get there, you know, and I would like us to have, also have a conversation on um, a statement made by Karl Marx about religion being an opium um, of the people. But let, let's talk, first of all, on his retrial. Um, the court, you know, um, in Kano State has said that uh, there were a lot of irregularities with the trial. What do you think it might be like, or what do you think must be done, you know, during the retrial uh, that might give him, you know, the freedom that he seeks? And how do you think it might play out? Yeah, I, I think that the, the new trial process uh, must begin with uh, legal representation, must have a lawyer. And then let us see what the charge is going to be. And I think that, you know, in doing the trial process, a very brilliant lawyer should be hired for him to look at the constitutionality of the offense itself in the first place. Does that law have a place under our law books? Does it have a, a position under our law that somebody is charged for blasphemy? And then how did he blaspheme? Now, if they have it as Sharia, you know, offense, does that law satisfy the constitutionality. These are issues that will come up by the trial process. You know, by the time the entire trial goes through and the lawyer makes his submission as to one, whether that law can stand its place in our jurisprudence and then makes a, a, a final you know, submission, either written or oral, concerning the, the trial as a, as a process. And then I think now the court will be in a position now to look at the constitutionality of that law and examine whether the man himself has even committed over. It's a question of who being a reasonable that then makes a pronouncement. Then they will start from there because I feel that this case will still end up at the Supreme Court. If I don't want this case to end up at the Supreme Court level, so that we can even for once, you know, really ascertain the position of some of these laws that have been enacted by some of the northern states you know, in our jurisprudence, does it have any place at all? I want the Supreme Court to be made to actually make a final pronouncement because it will act as a check and balance on some of these other laws, you know, and then subsequent actions by this state government in arresting people and trying them on law that are clearly unknown, you know, that has no you know place in our jurisprudence. So I think that would be what will, will transpire. So I, a, a lawyer, a brilliant lawyer, they should now give this uh, person a brilliant lawyer to represent him in the trial process and let him, you know, make, you know, really represent him ask necessary questions during cross-examination and then make a submission legally and allow the court to make a pronouncement, you know, based upon his submission, after which we can, you know, proceed from there, you know, in, you know, in regards to whatever sentence that would be uh, made by the pronouncement would be made by the court. And I think will, will happen in this uh, uh, retrial process. Um, you basically just touched on a key issue that I wanted to bring to your, uh, your notice. We know that basically the Supreme Court judgment is... is virtually final and we've been talking about how you know the judicial system needs to look at these 
issues of the Sharia law and take a stance on it. But this is a law that has been, has been you know, in practice since 1999. It's, it's, it's taken so long. Lots of people have lost their, their limbs. Lots of people have been flogged. Lots of people have been killed just because they broke a law that they said was blasphemous to their religion. So I, also, I want to ask you now, if this case eventually gets to the Supreme Court, seeing that their judgment is final, what's the likelihood that you know, it would be in favor for the Constitution and people's fundamental right to life? I have this absolute faith in our judicial system. I also have very you know, implicit faith in our Supreme Court. I, I, I have no doubt whatsoever that if this matter ever come up before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will clearly lean in favor of the Constitution. They will never violate it, even despite the fact that they, they, they may be uh, Muslims you know, that preside over the case. After all, the chief judge of Canada uh, that presided over this case and, and, and observed the regularity and has asked this particular matter to be uh, taken back for a trial, is also uh, must be a Muslim. But the, the training of lawyers and, and, by extension, judges, you know, is always to lean in favor of the, of the law, to lean in favor of the Constitution. And so if there is clear violation of the provisions of the Constitution by any enactment or by any act of any executive or any of the arms of government, I have no doubt in my mind at any point in time that the judicial sector will always lean in favor of the provisions of the law. And so let alone the Supreme Court, that is the final court of the land, that always uphold the provisions of the Constitution. They have made pronouncements that have actually made me to have implicit faith that there is no way any of this thing that is going on in all the northern states you know, will ever stand you know, the position of the law, you know, stand against the position of the law when it comes to the Supreme Court, you know, being in the final position to make a pronouncement. So I have this belief. But most times, these matters do not get to the Supreme Court. It's only in one instance that they have actually carried out a death sentence. And I don't think that the accused person, you know, took the matter up to Court of Appeal and Supreme Court. He ended at the lower court. And then most of the times also, most of the acts of these Sharia laws, you know, have actually been set aside by the lower court and nobody has taken it up to go to Court of Appeal and Supreme Court. But why do but you think that is? Night, yes. Why do you think that is, that these cases have not been taken up to the Supreme Court? It depends on the parties. If the state feels that, oh, okay, they have set aside our judgment, we're not ready to appeal. Well, the court will not be seized of any matter that is not brought before it. So importantly is that the matter must be taken up by any party who feels aggrieved. Now, if the person that was sentenced to the that individual, that I think there was one particular instance, and the person did not have the urge to appeal and felt that, oh, let me let me take the sentence and all that. What do you what do you expect the court to do? The court cannot just too much to begin to you know take over a matter that has not been actually appealed in this, uh, the court. So it it has to do with individuals. But I think the international and NGOs now have gotten interested in this case of our young man that was sentenced to death. And every attention is paid to it. You can see the comprehensive report given by CNN. And the other international bodies, like Amnesty International, they're also interested in this case. Then a lot of other NGOs in Nigeria are interested in, in this particular matter, especially on this issue of blasphemy. And that's why you see the, the, the awareness that has been created. So I think no matter what the sentence is, this matter may likely end up at the Supreme Court level, especially when it goes against the interest of that individual who mm -hmm. is a citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So it's, it's, it's the parties that actually take matters to court. The court can also a motu begin to assume jurisdiction over a matter that has not been brought before it. Mm. So well, then we can only hope that they have the right legal guidance yes, you know, and uh, you know, counsel to take this up. Yeah, and I think that's what, yeah, you know, yeah. one of the things that he also yeah. mentioned, you know, that he hopes that he has a good lawyer, you know, that would, you know, carry him all the way. But Mr. Obani, we're very likely going to come back to a conversation like this, maybe in the near future. It might not even take up to a year. If you remember also, um, you know, the, this same court has also set aside a ruling on uh, Umar Farouk, a 13-year-old boy who was sentenced to 10 years in prison, also for blasphemy. Um, years, mm -hmm. ago, years ago, a pastor's wife was killed in Kano State, um, also yes. for blasphemy. So we're yes. going to come back here at some point uh, if we don't make certain changes um, immediately. Um, people who have also maybe been punished by this, you know, same Sharia laws might feel yeah. um, some sense of injustice um, because they were not able to, you know, get an appeal. They were not able to, you know, get, you know, a, a higher courts to hear their case. Um, so... I what would I want you to appreciate? I want to appreciate your station for taking interest in things like this. 
It's by creating awareness like this that people begin to know what their rights and liabilities are actually. I mean, a television like you, I mean, station like yours have taken up this matter to reanalyze it and to educate Nigerians. So let's keep on raising the awareness and the consciousness that things should be done rightly in this nation and that things should not in any way be swept aside, especially on the issue of appeal. If you lose at the lower court, you have a right, you have an appellate option. Go to the, up to the Supreme Court level. And the Supreme Court takes issue of criminal cases uh, very serious. They always give it what they call expeditious trial process. It's not one of those cases that they usually, you know, you know, postpone 2023. And any, anything that has to do with criminal case that involves rights of individuals, the higher courts always take it serious and assign a new, a, a very, you know, clear date in order for for those things to be trashed out. So I think the awareness you guys are creating. You know, it's also very commendable and I appreciate this station for doing this. I, I want you to speak on legal representation. Uh, we would yes. expect that criminals, you know, when, when they talk about uh, Miranda, you know, if you don't have a lawyer, a lawyer will be presented to you. I don't know if that works in Nigeria. But I want you to speak on legal representation with regards to our justice system. Uh, for people who don't have the popularity or the resources to hire big lawyers, who don't have their cases make it to the news for civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations and CNN and international media, for those persons, what is mm -hmm. their fate with regards to legal representation that should take them to the appellate court and maybe all, all the way to the Supreme Court? Most times it's issue of knowledge, you know, and then publicity. I tell you this, Legal Aid Council is established in Nigeria, you know, and they have many, many lawyers that work in that particular body. And they, they are, their job is to ensure legal representation to the less privileged people in society. That is that particular law that was enacted and, and they are doing it. Now, even in Lagos State, where we all reside, uh, we know that uh, Lagos State uh, does this OPD uh, that has been established over time that gives also legal representation to those who are less privileged. If you don't have any money, you know, for any legal uh, matter, you go to them, they will represent you and handle your matter properly. I also know that many branches of the Nigerian Bar Association, they have clearly uh, the human rights particular uh, department that deals with issue of cases, you know, of representation, especially for the less privileged, and they handle them pro bono. Some of our law firms, like my own law firm too, my own law firm, Obani and Co, also handles cases pro bono on behalf of Nigerians, and I've been able to release so many Nigerians, you know, uh, from uh, from, deten uh, from detention. There was a man that spent almost 10 years that I got out recently. There are four or five of them that are ongoing now. They were they have been in prison for, for over four or five years, and there is no, you know, single charge against them. And I'm handling those cases pro bono. So it's a question of knowledge. You know, it's also a question of publicity. But I tell you that there are provisions although and there are structures in place, you know, for legal mm -hmm. representation, you know, pro bono by Nigerians, for those people that do not have money to handle their cases in court. You know, so uh, legal aid council have mentioned, OPD in Lagos, most of the branches of Nigerian Bar Association and most legal firms, you know, handle it. And for you to be a senior advocate of Nigeria now, a requirement is that you must have shown evidence of how some of these cases pro bono on behalf of Nigerians who are desperate. So all these are in place in order to give law and Nigerians legal representation, despite the fact that the, the issue of legal fees is very costly. There are many persons that can benefit from pro bono uh, matters if they can bring such cases to the knowledge of uh, those who are in position to help them. All right. All right, um, Mr. Obani, the last question before we let you go. We see that there's a continued crackdown on religious uh, speech in Nigeria. The certain statements you can make, you know, in certain parts of the country. And if we can all agree that this contravenes the constitution, contravenes our rights as humans, as, you know, citizens of Nigeria, why don't we, why hasn't the federal government or, you know, legal representatives taken this up to force the hand of the government to maybe sign an executive order to repeal the Sharia law? Why has this not happened? And what do you think will be the response of, you know, these states to this if it eventually happens? As I said earlier, the issue of awareness is key. We must keep on pushing this. It depends on who is in power at any point in time. If somebody who is in power is a, you know, a religious extremist, you allow certain things to happen. But if somebody that comes into power knows that the constitution is supreme, it will never allow any provision of the constitution to be breached. Uh, and so, but the awareness of the citizens and the alertness of the citizens is very key. We should be able to push these things. America is, is what it is today uh, because of you know institutions, and those institutions do not emerge overnight. There has been recurrent you know cry. There has been recurrent push. You know, we look at even the issue of life, uh, Black Lives Matters. Even as strong and even as uh, civilized as American uh, countries, 
see what happened with the treatment of blacks even there. But people keep on pushing. And then after pushing, then there will be some amendments in the, 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 the procedures and laws. So I think that the citizens will be the one to actually insist on things being done in, in, their, in accordance with the provisions of the constitution. Because the man that may be at the helm of Afia may be a religious extremist and we want to, you know, perpetuate some of these extremities, you know, you know in his, uh, you know, policy pronouncement, or may not be interested in actually curtailing the excesses of those who pursue the extremism. But mm -hmm. it is this alertness of the citizen. And then with strong institutions like the judiciary, you know, saying, no, this cannot happen, you know, despite all you are thinking as a, as a leader and all that. See what happened with Trump. Trump tried all he could in order to set aside all you know, the electoral process of America and, and you know, rubbish it. But the institutions, the, even those that he appointed into the Supreme Court, you know, told him pointedly that, look, we cannot operate on sentiment. Bring your facts, bring your evidence. And when they didn't see those evidence, they, they of course, you know, set aside all the all his, uh, all his prize and who is you know. So I think that it is institution, the people, the alertness of the people, the institution that can make this country what it should be. That is what I think. And we must keep on raising the awareness. We must also keep right. on raising the consciousness. And we must be very strong in, a, in pursuit of things that are right in this nation. And if we do it, by the time in 20, 30 years, we will begin to have institutions that are very strong, imagine, and the citizens are being, being not afraid of certain acts of state you know, that goes contrary to the provisions of the constitution. All so right. it's the alertness of the people. If you Thank and I you. have a role to play, in this regard, sir. So Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I also just noticed that we are all putting on red this morning. Uh, thank <laughs> you, <laughs> Mr. Albani. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, my thank pleasure. You. Thanks for speaking with us. I'm sure our viewers totally enjoyed your take. Uh, good morning thank to you, you once again. God um, bless you guys. Yeah. I, oh. One one part you know that I would you know quickly mention before we go uh, is the fact where there is also a lot of lapses with our judicial system and our criminal justice system. Um, that normally should be prosecuting whoever burnt his father's house. Um, you, and nobody's uh, no, talking no, about nobody's that. Nobody's talking <clears throat> about that, you know. So, so that, that crime has been committed uh, by arsonists, by people who felt like they could take the laws into their hands, and they're walking around free The father today. had to they, escape the, to a neighboring yeah, town the, just the, to protect the, the his The woman life. who was killed in, in Kano also a couple of years ago, the pastor's wife, um, dead, you know, I don't remember anybody going to jail for a murder. You know, because of how sensitive religion is and because of how much, you know, it has sunk into the soul of, you know, a lot of people in some parts of Nigeria. And so those parts, you know, we should not let them just slide. Those are crimes that were committed and they should be, you know, exactly. they should be treated they as crimes. Be, yeah, exactly. That's, what, that's why I raised the issue of an executive order. Because I do understand Obani's stance on saying that people have a responsibility to speak out. But imagine you being a girl in northern Nigeria wanting to speak out and you get arrested for blasphemy as well, yeah. simply because you were trying to speak up for somebody who was arrested for blasphemy. You can imagine just how delicate this whole thing is. Uh, double honor. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so we're going on a short break. Uh, when we come back, we have more to talk about. Donald, um, Joe Biden, apparently, uh, of course, has lifted a visa ban on Nigerians and other countries. And we're going to be talking about the details of that. Is that good news for Nigerians? And what does that really mean with regards to the United States building a better relationship with other nations? Uh, stay with us. We'll be back.